Fallout New Vegas is a game where you play as a mailman, and if you didn't know better, would assume it's just more of your average 2000s era slop. But not quite. Over 10 years ago now, so yeah, about back in the Stone Age, I walked by this case with a gas mask freak on it and picked it up. I then promptly put it back down since I thought to myself it looks like some nerd shit. See, I was one of those who played Call of Duty before it was the Husk Activision squeeze to death, and I had no attention span for RPGs. Then after I thought to myself, well, the game's in a $5 bargain bin, then might as well give it a try. I was absolutely enthralled by its charm. While the game presents itself as a rough and tough apocalypse game, where else can you be friends with a robot dog and a mutant grandmother? New Vegas immediately shows you your place in the wasteland hierarchy by giving you a friendly bullet to the brain before you even start. The game was rigged from the start. You are the local Amazon driver and everything in this wasteland is a raging pit bull. But like Amazon drivers, those packages will be delivered or there will be consequences. While at the beginning you are, quite literally, an insignificant little shrimp, by the end you will become a wasteland warrior able to reshape the world through gratuitous gunfire or by just becoming a cult leader. You were entrusted to deliver a small platinum casino chip. In the interest of ensuring its arrival, it seems that the client you were working for sent a Securitron named Victor. He's the robot cowboy that ripped you away from your permanap in the ground. Apparently in this universe, one of your job benefits is brain insurance because unlike most blue-collar workers, you actually live through this without being crushed by debt shortly after. When you wake up after your close encounter of the lead kind, you are greeted by Doc Mitchell, who I sincerely doubt has a medical license. He's your guide to all things, uh, introspective. As with all Americans, your first possession is the Fallout equivalent of an iPad, followed closely by a handgun. Good Springs is the first town you get to ruin or save. The game allows you to choose between the outcome. Allow a gang of murderers and explosive fanatics to attack and claim the town, or defend it and be the hero to a backwater town that shares a communal bucket. This theme of choice will be with you for the rest of your time as a dusty goblin man. The reason for this little kerfuffle is the presence of this man right here named Ringo will, for Sorry some reason, almost right Just away trust you and play a card game a that story. nobody knows how to play. Oh my god. We can agree to help him, as he um, might be useful later on, but wait. this now means we have to bonk all of Cobb's guys. Afterwards, the world is our irradiated gross oyster. Just, uh, don't go north or you'll find out just how much a rad scorpion tail hurts. As you may have noticed, if you're not completely blind, the game does not render each individual hair on the local pyromaniac's Play-Doh-based beard, which means that this game is older than most people on YouTube. The game looks a little... hmm... a bit dated. This can be fixed by using mods, which can heavily alter the game. Some can completely modernize it with new weapons and armor, as well as graphics that turn your GPU into a goddamn jet engine. That said, the weapons in the base game are plentiful and well-balanced overall with scaling that actually makes sense. Rather than scaling based on level becoming damage, scaling is based on your current location. For example, you won't ever find any rocket launchers being fired at you in Prim, but you might get shredded by a minigun in South Vegas at high levels. This means that if you find a weapon you enjoy, it doesn't really matter where in the hierarchy of rarity it is, it will still be capable of doing the same damage. However, enemies do gain health to compensate, but by investing in the gun's melee or energy skill, damage will increase to catch up. This creates a system where player investment in skills is rewarded by allowing the player to feel as if they have actually grown more capable with the weapons they have, rather than just ditching it and finding a new one that magically does two extra points of damage. If I want to keep my shitty little tire iron, the game will let me, and it will be a god killer. The combat AI, unfortunately, is very basic, with most enemies displaying an IQ of room temperature, that is often trying their best to rush you with varying degrees of success. Occasionally, though, the AI will have flashes of intelligence, which can make for intense combat, especially at higher levels when energy weapons are more common. It can be very difficult to fight an enemy when you are turned into a pile of ash. This is considered a humane and preferable method of euthanasia in the world of Fallout, as the soil is instantly fertilized. Most of the time, though, you'll be talking more than shooting with many of the well-written and memorable characters, like PTSD, the Hulk, and Elvis. Yes, really. The dialogue system is extremely simple. You see the entirety of what your character will say before you say it in a list. This should not be a point of admiration, but when more recent games give you only the choice of yes, no, sarcasm, and information, this system seems revolutionary. 
Within dialogue, there are a number of skill checks which work off of a simple principle. If you have skill, you can do thing. If not, then figure out another way or fail the dialogue. This may seem frustrating on the surface, however it leads to an engrossing first playthrough when it is still unknown what skills and perks are useful, and what are actual trash. However, even with that, any build is extremely viable to finish the game with, since the game is just that open-ended. Crackhead build with a heavy focus on chem use and melee? Completely doable. Complete pacifist that runs away from every fight and uses speech and barter to get their way? Absolutely viable. The limits to character creation are nearly endless. It can also be very atmospheric at times with long stretches of solitude, which are interrupted by conversations in towns and cities, reflecting on morality, war and peace, authoritarianism, and uh, also drugs and prostitution. This lends the game a very elderly method of play. Patience as well as persistence is essential. It is no coincidence, then, that in a totally real survey I did not just make up, at least 80% of Fallout New Vegas players have age-related arthritis, and the other 20% are too busy napping at the old folks' home to respond. This is amplified by the fact that the war that caused the apocalypse destroyed all the music made after the 60s for some reason, and not because Bethesda can't buy the rights to 90s music like was referenced in the first two games. That being said, every radio in this game is filled with Grandpappy's jams. Grandpappy had some good taste though, because almost every song is memorable, and an absolute bop. Just make sure not to break your hip while busting it down. The game is very charming, even if it looks like it was made with a TI-84 calculator. The development of the game was rushed as hell, with only 18 months given, which while insane, they managed to actually cobble this thing together using Bethesda's broken down dumpster fire held together with bubblegum thoughts and prayers known as Gamebryo, the game is similar with as many bugs as a terrarium. Most won't ruin the experience beyond a mild inconvenience, but believe me, there are the bad ones. You shouldn't have too bad of an experience though, as long as you don't try to break the game too bad. Alternatively, mod the shit out of it with patches to make it work, but if you're willing to go through all of that, you'll find the real reason this game shines. The story is one of the most well thought out and executed RPG stories ever written. While on a small scale there are hiccups here and there, the amount of player freedom is immense. The aforementioned proverbial clubbing of baby seals was just one small example of this freedom. Ruling various parts of this giant death trap is a few different factions. The returning NCR, who are a giant troop of incompetent boy scouts, with even more scandals. The Legion, a group of red-pilled r slash sigma male Rome cosplayers. And Mr. House, who just so happens to be an old-ass rich guy with plans for world domination. I'll let you fill in the joke on that one. These factions are mostly well-developed groups of people rather than just one big character, except for Mr. House, who is still very well written, but is really running his show alone. The NCR is an attempt at a return to the old world. They dress like World War I-era US troops and claim to follow the tenets of democracy despite having only had five presidents in the hundred years since they were founded. They tend to usually set out with goals to help as many people as they can, but due to incompetence or infighting, end up screwing up royally. This leads to a fascinating picture of a group that are, on the outset, the objective best option, yet are hobbled due to their own bureaucratic nature. As one character in the game puts it, the NCR is split like any two-headed animal, trying to go in different directions, ending up nowhere. On the other side is the Legion, under their leader Caesar. Caesar is the edgy kid in high school who spent too much time listening to alpha male podcasts and is the type of guy to misinterpret philosophy and use it to insult you. He specifically decides to use Hegelian dialects to justify himself. Just one teensy little problem. That's not what Hegel said! Hegelian dialects is not a system of argument by using thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. That was a work of Fichte. The great irony is that Hegel actually disagreed with Fichte. It's instead a system of determining evolution of thought. Not an argument to justify might makes right, but that is one of the most important aspects to Caesar. He may or may not know what he says is wrong, but he knows how to manipulate language and philosophy to suit his arguments, even if he is just blatantly wrong. While on the surface, the Legion is evil, and they are. There is a decent amount of in-game evidence that the Legion territory is actually much safer than NCR territory due to their harsh nature. While this does not absolve them, it could give some reasons to fight in their favor. Between both of them, both metaphorically and physically, is the Strip, led by Mr. House and his robot army. Mr. House is Elon Musk if, instead of making Twitter somehow worse, he connected his consciousness with a computer and built big shiny tin cans to blow up those he didn't like. He also just so happens to be the one you are working for to deliver the platinum chip, as his chip is actually a USB drive 
containing robo-steroids for all of his Securitrons. Mr. House's philosophy is basically Ancapistan, except the An is switched for Autocrat. That claims not to want to interfere in a person's daily life, while simultaneously having the technology to murder you at any time for funsies. In most games, as a faction leader, he, as well as Caesar and the NCR's leader, would be invulnerable due to being required for story progression. In New Vegas, not so. In fact, if you really wanted to, your first action outside of Good Springs could be to journey all the way to the leaders and shoot them in their various faces. In fact, there are no essential NPCs except technically one, but I wouldn't count it. That means if you don't like a certain group or faction, go nuts. Just be prepared to deal with the consequences. I would recommend against it, though, simply to allow the game to first inform your choices on who to get rid of in your perfect Vegas. All of these three factions are fighting over one thing, the Hoover Dam. Being a pre-war power generator, it is a very enticing prize for any would-be wasteland conqueror, and all three factions have their very hungry eyes on it. You as the courier have the power to deliver this power, in a both literal and metaphorical sense, to each of these factions as you alone hold the keys to victory in the wastes. You could, if so inclined, even take the power for yourself instead, and claim New Vegas as your own. Owing to the extremely open-ended story, you could feasibly play the game many times, and get a different ending each run which makes New Vegas a highly replayable game, although due to knowledge gained from a previous playthrough, dialogue and skill choices are spoiled. This could also be a positive, as now full freedom is available in exactly how the Courier's story plays out. Your first run could be spent as a heroic wanderer of the wastes, and your second could be as a goblin that pickpockets all the caps from everyone you meet. The DLC is its own can of worms. All of them have something special about them. Old World Blues with its fun characters and incredible charm. Honest Hearts with its morally gray conflict. Dead Money with its incredible aesthetic and message. And Lonesome Road with its deep tie-in to the main story. All are worth playing for the same reasons as the base game and more. Each DLC also has their own main quest and side quests with multiple endings and add new world spaces to explore and loot. The early game does get repetitive though and Frankly, between beating Cobb with a tire iron or throwing dynamite at the locals for fun and profit, sometimes I kind of wish it could just be skipped. Fallout New Vegas is not about the competing factions in the Wasteland, as none of them seem to be a clear answer with downsides to all. Instead, it's actually about one simple thing. Choice. The ability to choose is everywhere, and rarely if ever are you presented a situation where an option you'd think of is not available to you. Every choice that you make might be a small choice that affects very little, or it could have far-reaching consequences visually affecting the entire Mojave. In a world with no perfect choices, how do you find the lesser evil? Is law and order worth it if the cost is free choice? And is liberty a worthy prize if it brings with it a system that can be manipulated to erode the very foundation it was built upon? Regardless, it makes you think about what you're doing and whether you're making a better world or an awful nightmare. This game is lightning in a bottle. With most of the original writers leaving Obsidian and Bethesda intent so far and changing focus in the games, the future of Fallout seems up in the air. We may never see a true continuation of New Vegas' legacy. However, even if we never receive a proper follow-up, I'll always be glad that at least we got this masterpiece. If you haven't played it yet, go give it a shot. It's usually really cheap with all the DLC, and it'll give you hundreds of hours of playtime. Anyway, thank you very much for watching this nonsense I just made. If you enjoyed it, consider subscribing. I'd really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, see you next time.